Okay, guys, hope, hope, hopefully you can see those slides okay. Um, very, very quick introduction. So I'm, I'm, I'm Rod Cullen. I'm co-presenting today with uh, my colleagues, Stephen and, and, uh, and, and Janet, who've been sort of in, integral to the, uh, the, the work that we've been over the last two or three years. Um, I do want to just to quickly introduce yourself, guys, and say what, say what you're doing within the institution. Uh, yeah, can do. So I'm Stephen Williams. I'm one of the senior technology enhanced learning advisors at Manmet, uh, and I work with Rod in the technology enhanced learning team. Thanks, Stephen. And I'm Janet Lord. I'm the director of education in the Faculty of Health and Education. But probably more relevantly in this context, I'm the strategic lead for what we call Delta, which is our digitally enhanced learning, teaching and assessment strategy, which has just gone live, basically. I'm really delighted to be here with you today. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. So we're, we're going to talk about kind of a it's a so the long, the long term piece of work that we started before COVID, but then kind of gained momentum during the pandemic and has kind of paved the way for stuff that we're doing now around that digital education strategy. So it's kind of a long story, really, but there's a, there's a lot of things that we know resonate with other colleagues. We've presented a little bit on this this previously. We've had a lot of sort of contact from other institutions asking us, you know, about practical aspects of the way that we managed to implement this particular toolkit. So. We just wanted to kind of share that. So, um, quick uh, sort of start of a ten. In the discussions with with our colleagues at the Alt Sig, what we agreed was to do an initial blog post that kind of set the scene, the background to our project, and the approach that we'd adopted to select a set of tools that we might make available to the OLE institution, which is our learning activities framework. In the second part, which is the webinar, we're going to talk about how we selected the apps how we went about procurement, how we rolled it out, our approach around accessibility, and basically how things have gone. Part three of this will be a follow-up blog post where we'll kind of basically write up the stuff that we're covering in the webinar and we'll approach any issues that might arise as part of the discussions that we uh, that we enter into today. Um, and so very, very quick poll. I'm going to see if I can launch this poll. Uh, Collaborates a tiny little bit quirky, so it doesn't always allow you to do these things. Right, but just, just interested to know who who's actually read the poll. Um, so if I, hopefully you should be able to see that now. Um, yeah, it's working fine. Brilliant. Okay, so I can see that as well. So if you can just kind of pop your response in there, not kind of, idea <laughs> not to name and shame anybody. It just kind of gives me an idea of how much detail to go into in terms of the background. And so we've got quite a few people. Some, some people read it, some have skimmed it. We've got a few that haven't read it. So apologies to those who've read it. There's a little bit of revision at the beginning here, but hopefully everybody will get the kind of the, the gist of, of where, we, where we started with this. Um, and so we do a lot of kind of engagement with our students. We do a lot of uh, talking and, and engagement with our academic staff as well. Just close that, uh, close that poll down. Um, and for a long time, our students through our internal student survey, which we analyze in quite a lot of, of, of depth, were telling us quite clearly that they wanted to be much more involved in their live face-to-face -face teaching sessions rather than being passive recipients of information. So they're particularly critical of death by PowerPoint experiences. The common sort of comment is, you know, I can read slides for myself. I don't have to come in and sit for two hours just listening to somebody regurgitating their notes. I want to be more involved. Features of the kind of feedback of the things that they really liked were quizzes and polls, discussion and debate activities, tools like Mentimeter, Padlet and Coot featured very heavily in that kind of feedback where it was being used. And a feature of that was being able to make contributions in what they considered to be a safe way through anonymity that's offered by a few of these tools. At the same time, our teaching staff were saying, yeah, we get that. Um, we're, you know, we really aspire to meet in that particular challenge. We want to use more technology to provide interactive teaching, but the university doesn't provide me with any tools and using the free tools that are available out there makes it really difficult and makes it risky. Um, so lots of them wanted to use more than now, but a lot of colleagues were telling us, I'm not confident enough to use those free tools myself. It takes me ages to set things up. I'm worried about GDPR because sometimes I have to sign students up or give my own details where, I've got problems with paying for licenses and stuff like that. Um, I get the free licenses as limited functionality. And then 
I just get used to using something and the terms and conditions change and it's no longer free. And so there was a lot of it, it was a clear barrier to some colleagues using these tools was that notion of having to find the tools for themselves that were free and then things that were changing. And so initially that's, that was our kind of our, our starting point. But to summarize that kind of, just as a kind of a pause for thought, Ian said that they, you know, from the blog post, those aspirations kind of resonated with him or those experiences. So if you could just pop on the chat, yes or no, or, you know, we have a different experience, be interesting to hear whether those aspirations and challenges reflect the, the experience in your institution. So if you could just do that in, in, in the chat, I'd appreciate it. Or if you want to kind of pop your hand up and say something equally, we would, uh, we would value to hear what you have to say. I just wanted to say just from uh, Northampton's point of view, uh, we've just completed the JISC digital insight survey and there's a question there on uh, the degree to which um, students like interactive sessions or feel that their material is actually engaging and whilst it's increasing there's definitely um, room for improvement there and it, it yeah. does reflect some of the stuff I think that that you've got on the screen. Yeah I think so I mean I think that's you know our, our experience is it kind of we we were analysing. We don't we don't use the JISC survey. We've got our own internal student survey, which we've run annually since 2010, and it's just a re, it was a reoccurring theme where it was happening. Students were really positive about it. Where it wasn't happening, they were comparing the experience, the good experiences, and using that as a benchmark to say, why can't we have more of this on these other units? So, thanks for that. Yeah, and it, it it seems absolutely kind of you know from the comments that we're getting very very similar experiences uh, from the student perspective and in terms of the, the the staff experience of these things as well. So thank you for that. So um, then we kind of hit a tricky problem. I'm sure you're all aware of this, but there's a DAF for pretty much everything. There's hundreds of them, um, even in our kind of initial kind of re review of what 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 colleagues were doing. You know, we were finding the colleagues were using all sorts of things within the institution at that time. So this is going back pre uh, pre pandemic. We didn't provide any institutionally licensed apps for colleagues. We had a couple of small scale things going on in different departments and stuff like that, which kind of added to the confusion because some colleagues did have access to things and other colleagues didn't. And there was it's like, well, why, why have they got it? Why have we not got it? Um, but it poses the, the tricky problem which apps do you include you know, what, what what should our toolkit comprise of so that was our sort of main starting point um, and so what we did was we 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 we, we entered i'm not going to go through this in a massive amount of detail because it's covered in the in the blog post but essentially what we did was we engaged with our faculty-based technology enhanced learning advisors and got them to work with their academic colleagues to create these simple scenarios and case studies that were almost kind of agnostic of the tool that was being used to describe the kinds of activities that they were they were delivering in their in their classroom teaching situations, um, and we used those twenty five uh, case studies in a literature review and we categorised the, the the baseline things that they were do they were doing, so we kind of reduced it to kind of the the the. the the, the lowest common denominator, if you like, and we came up with this active learning uh, framework, which describes kind of five main types of activity that colleagues were, 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 were engaging their students in with a series of different subtypes. So these are the five activities here. So personal learning and what we mean by that were in the class session, students were being in, in, encouraged to do basic stuff like taking notes and managing those notes, maybe using tools like OneNote or Evernote and things like that, um, or some kind of resource collation or management. So that was mainly kind of links and resources and often using the kind of the built in tools in, in web browsers to bookmark things. Um, there was a lot of kind of stuff around presentation delivery so the traditional kind of thing like I'm using now like like PowerPoint both being used by staff and by students I um, mean then there was a little kind of uh, pocket of use of uh, using tools that delivered presentation in a slightly different way 
So rather than having a screen at the front of the classroom, the presentation was delivered on the students own devices and the students in some instances could work through the materials at their own pace rather than being led through materials by a tutor. So that was an, that was an interesting observation. There was lots of stuff around the tutors asking questions of classes or groups of students or whole groups of students. And we've sort of broken that down into several kind of subcategories. So just using technology to deliver simple objective tests like MCQs, more complex objective type questions. And um, so uh, that might be kind of matching questions. That might be um, where you're allowed to kind of uh, annotate hotspots and put things onto diagrams and stuff like that, but still objective questions nevertheless. There was a lot of use of questioning in a gamified way. So splitting the class up into small groups and doing like a pub quiz type thing. Um, and getting students talking to each other before making single responses that were then fed back to the whole class. Lots of these tools also employed some kind of free text question response, and that was dealt handled slightly separately from the MCQ type uh, responses. And, and then kind of survey, surveying and opinion seeking tools, M maybe the same tools, but being used in a slightly different way. A lot of stuff around collaborative tasks, so where students are doing kind of group work, where they're being asked to create ideas, um, to, to, to draw things, to, to share ideas, to, to, to work together as a group, to collaborate and uh, uh, collate uh, resources in a single place using kind of whiteboard type tools. Lots of examples of students being asked to plan an activity, to, to do project management type stuff using simple digital tools. Lots of examples of students working on shared documents. So probably one of the best examples of that is using a shared spreadsheet to collect data and to use the whole class to collect lots of data so that you've got enough data to analyze at a statistically significant level, or significant at a viable level, um, if you like. Um, small amount of colleagues using kind of peer review, peer assessment type tools. And then the final type of activity was student questioning, where they, it's kind of flipped round where the students were pushing questions almost as a back channel to staff during their live teaching sessions. And so when it kind of did, you know, all of the different kinds of activities that we found at different levels, whether it be kind of badged up as active learning or problem based learning or place based learning, when it boiled down to it, these five main activity types with these subtypes were at the core of it. And so we thought maybe we can use this framework as a way of helping us to select a relatively small number of tools that meet the needs of the maximum number of people, recognizing that we're probably never gonna nail it for absolutely everybody. So um, I'm just gonna pop a link, uh, should just bear with me a second, into, uh, into the chat. Very easy to do this in uh, collaborate, but just bear with me a second. So we've got a link to a little Padlet here. And uh, what we're interested in here is just getting an idea for the categories that I've just described, the categories rather than the subcat. What kind of tools are you using in your institution? Um, and um, whether or not you're centrally licensing them at, at, at the moment. So I uh, are you aware of staff using them as free free versions? Do you encourage staff to use them as free versions? Or have you kind of taken some steps towards licensing those tools? So under personal learning, presentation delivery, tutor questioning, collaborative tasks, and student, student questioning, just pop your ideas and they just click on the plus, un, plus underneath the respective columns. And also, are there any activity types that you think we've missed? Is there anything that you, know, that, that you think is obviously glaring a mission uh, from in, in the context of in-class teaching. Rod, I think that's the... Oh, thank you, Stephen. It's all right. It's the oh, it's in the wrong link. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. All right. Thanks, Stephen. I'm just going to pop the... Uh, the Padlet on the screen and we can see as things come through. So, so Office 365 featuring um, in terms of personal learning. 
So, Gabe, so kind of in, in, interested to know if uh, I, I'm guessing Office 365 is centrally licensed, but you can just kind of pop a little bit of an addition onto this to whether or not you're centrally licensing centrally licensing them um, or using the free tools. That would be uh, that would be interesting to know. That's an interesting po point about those kind of authentic practical learning experiences like nursing and physio. Um, I think um, one of the things that we recognized is that there's always going to be kind of specific and special cases that perhaps is a tool that you're not going to license centrally for a whole institution. And we'll come to that uh, a little bit later when we talk about how we're kind of taking this kind of stuff forward. Yep. I'm not surprised to see that Padlet and Miro are featuring quite every in the notion of these collaborative tasks um, near pod as well. Um, there's a couple of things around presentation delivery that I don't recognize inspiring is a new one on me. Um, uh, it's an interesting point about Mentimeter as well. We have seen some colleagues who kind of shifted away from using PowerPoint to using Mentimeter as a presentation tool rather than purely and simply for its, um, its uh, 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 objective testing tools. MS Teams as well, featuring in student questioning. So for, for us, student questioning has been kind of facilitated in a few different ways. So we've seen colleagues using things like Twitter. And one of the tools that we use, Vvox, as a kind of a separate back channel that, uh, that, 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 that can be used as a Q&A mechanism as well. Brilliant. Coding and mathematical tools. I think, again, that kind of sits under that kind of more specialist area. We do have um, uh, a couple of tools that are used exclusively in Faculty of Science and Engineering, like MATLAB and um, a couple of engineering simulation tools that are used as well. Um, but they're, they're kind of licensed by the faculty rather than by the institution as a whole. I think for some of the, for some of the bigger things, what we're finding is a kind of like, when you when you distill it down from the the over, overarching activity, the overarching model, within particular things like like scenarios um, and case studies, personal learning, presentation, questioning, collaborative tasks, etc., they're the kind of the features of those kinds of bigger types of activity, um, and you're not necessarily using one single tool to facilitate those things. You're using a combination of different things. Okay. Thanks for that, everybody. That's that's really uh, that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to move on for that. It's really really useful to, to 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 see those. So very kind of similar similar set of tools that seem to be kind of featuring. Um, uh, it, it's, it's it's almost like kind of out of the whole kind of mist and fog of everything that's available, a core set is kind of emerging across the sector as well, which is uh, which is interesting. Okay, so. What we were able to do was to take um, uh, this is a gross oversimplification of the process. We had lots of discussion with colleagues. We engaged with our ed te educational technologies community of practice. We ran focus groups. We had lots of spreadsheets looking at functionality and comparing different tools and stuff like that. But when it boiled down to it, we kind of focused on or we, we came down to five main tools. I'll say a little bit about why we cho chose those. So we focused primarily on sort of tutor questioning and co collaboration activities because we found that some of the things like the personal learning and presentation delivery were covered by things that we already had in Office 365. Um, and so there wasn't a need to kind of bring in specific apps to address those kinds of things. Um, and so the VVOX was is a is a quizzing very very simple uh, objective question tool, and it was kind of if you like our kind of start the introductory level thing, um, because it is integrated into PowerPoint really neatly, and we felt it provided a little bit of a comfort blanket for some of our colleagues who we wanted to get involved in this. It seemed from the conversations that we had for, for some people, extending the functionality of PowerPoint was much less of a troubling uh, uh, ask than learning what they perceived to be a completely separate, different tool. Um, and so we we kind of took that on board and we went with, with Vivox. In order to get a more complex range of 
object feed box is very simple mcqs uh single answer multiple answer um it does a very very basic rudimentary uh, free text question um, and it has a very very simple matching question type and that, that that's about it um a lot of colleagues were already kind of beyond that and so we went with mentimeter as a more sophisticated tool and although mentimeter does have a kind of powerpoint integration we found that it was it was really inadequate it was really slow it just didn't work but it works really well as a standalone tool and gives a lot of flexibility we had a lot of colleagues who were really kind of big on the gamified objective question where they were using it as kind of energizer activities in the classroom getting a little bit of competition going with their students and and kahoot um, in terms of the feedback that we got for students was incredibly popular despite the fact that for some of us it's it, it seems a little childlike students were really really positive about it and about the way that it was being used so we went with kahoot as well we went with neopod um, because we already had a kind of a user base for this who were using it in, a, in quite a specific way using it as, as a kind of a very kind of but very quite sophisticated active learning where the students were doing a little bit of the session that was tutor led then they were doing a little bit of plays a bit of stuff that was asynchronous there was a lot of group work activities there was a lot of stuff in accountancy that was using uh, neopod where they were doing demonstrations of things in excel and students were being led through some instructions in neopod and then going off and doing some practical tasks in uh, in excel and then feeding back through the tools that were built into neopod um, and then in terms of the collaborative tasks really really simple versatile tool allows you to do lots of things very very adaptive it's the digital equivalent of a flip chart and post-it notes i think um padlet just seemed like a bit of a no-brainer for us because it was very very popular with academic colleagues very very easy to use um and we already had a lot of kind of positive feedback um on uh, on, on on padlet and so that was essentially the decision making process that we went through um and so vvox mentimeter kahoot neopod and padlet became our toolkit um, at manchester met we kind of we have a what we call the core plus model of learning technologies where the we have a moodle and microsoft teams are at the, the core the different le levels are kind of described based on the level of support that the institution provides for them so at the core we create all the accounts we get everything set up and there's an expectation that all staff will utilize them in the practice in the arrange section we create the accounts and we make sure that students have access sorry staff have access and training and most staff will be using these tools recommended are things that we're aware of and we kind of encourage staff to use them but we might not license um, and there's no real expectation that everybody will use them and then there's a whole load of stuff in the periphery where we're fairly sure that staff will be experimenting with these kinds of things but we advise them a little bit of caution because they're not supported by the institution in effect what we were doing with our project neopod mentimeter padlet and vvox were out in the outer rings and with our project we were bringing them into the center into this arranged section where we were taking more responsibility for them as an institution um, and um, and, and developing a, a, a toolkit that staff were more expected to use um, so that's what just going to bring janet here as well because we want to, to, to give some information about how, how we kind of went about kind of presenting this to the institution as a project. So would you like to say something about that, Janet, please? Thanks, thanks, Rod. So um, <clears throat> we thought it was really important that we we did a trial. Uh, so we set up a steering group and as a relatively senior member of staff, I chaired the steering group um, and the steering group had some clout. Uh, and so as you can see on the on the slide, and we think that's really important. We, ha we actually took this forward in the end as a proper project and uh, with me as the sponsor of it uh, and that meant that it had some institutional clout um, so as you can see what we did in the trial where we did a sort of six month trial uh, it cost us about thirty thousand pounds to do some trial um, uh, uh, licenses and during that time we provided all kinds of support that um, Rod will talk about but also we monitored this really really carefully um, and so that was the first thing that we did and we kept a really close eye on it didn't we Rod yeah absolutely 
Um, but I think the you know the, the important thing is we had we had we had senior buy in at, right right the right way from the start. Yeah. Um, so the key aims for our trial though was that we wanted to make it easy to request licenses. So there's a, there's a comment in there about things being agile. We wanted to make it really quick and easy. So if somebody wanted one of these apps, they could get it really really quickly that they didn't have to have somebody coming out and playing around on their machine. So the idea was make a request, rapidly create the accounts remotely, make them available with ManMet, their ManMet credentials. So it was on their, their ManMet laptop. We wanted to provide effective technological and pedagogic support for using the apps. And overall, we wanted to perceive this notion of risk and build confidence in using those apps. Um, and so, Stephen's going to kind of explain a little bit about how we achieved aim aim one and one one and two. Yes. Yeah, so when we um, first introduced the trial, we knew from um, the outset that we wanted to make sure any processes that we were going through or asking staff to go through when they were requesting licenses was something that can be continued afterwards. Sometimes with with these projects and trials, it does fall on, down to the the project teams. Um, and sometimes then when you go to scale it up, uh, it's not appropriate because it's a different process. So uh, we made use of um, the university's current ticketing system. Um, so staff could go to the uh, portal, choose the piece of software that they'd like to request, uh, fill out the basic form, um, ID number, uh, for the case of VVox, a uh, asset ID for their machine. So VVox could be installed for the PowerPoint plugin. Um, that was then sent through to the helpline team where they would either create account through the through the browser um, or add them to a group policy. Uh, all of them were set up for single sign on. Uh, so really, really quick and easy for staff to get started. They weren't having to manage additional passwords and things like that. Once the account was set up, the instructions were sent out via email to staff, which included how to get started with the particular app that they'd chosen, um, as well as some other kind of quick tips, instructions on our intranet pages, um, and a, a few other areas of support. And the really good, good thing for all this was that because we already obviously had the account set up and the license is ready to go, um, the majority of the time it was completed within 24 hours. Uh, so once staff had made a request, it was really quick and simple for them. Uh, so they could get going uh, with it within within the, a working day, really, which was uh, which was really good. I think one, one of the one of the successes that is, is quite often colleagues were going away from the initial contact with the health team so if they contact them on the phone by the time they came off the phone the tool was installed on their device um and and that was a real kind of a real a real a real big win win for us um and that's something which has continued since uh, i have to say so th that's that's now kind of ingrained in the way that we uh, that, that we we handle uh, our apps for teaching and learning and um, in terms of our kind of initial um evaluation uh we're really really high level of interest right from the off. So we had nearly you know, 450, nearly 500 uh, individual requests. So that's individual members of staff. The majority were academic teaching staff. Uh, it's about 30% of our full-time staff actually requested uh, licenses right the way from the off. Importantly, we had about 44 colleagues from uh, professional services, so student-facing professional service as well. And within the, 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 the initial trial period, over 70% of uh, those expressions of interest became active users. And so we, we ended up just during the trial period, colleagues ran over 1200 sessions, leading to over 20,000 interactions with our students. Importantly for us, in terms of the evaluation, um, nine out of 10 colleagues, I and mean, you very rarely get this with an IT project, where nine out of 10 colleagues considered the sign up installation and setup to be very easy and straightforward. So that, that again was something that we were really positive about. Uh, do you want to say anything more about that, Stephen? Uh, no, I, th I think what, one of the, the real successes or what enabled the future success was that initial initial trial and the amount of staff that were involved it, it also kind of really showed that there was a need for for these apps in the future um, whereas obviously yeah. if we had a, a smaller number of, of staff signing up to the apps um, we might not have been able to put really put the weight down on the um, the cases in the future for expanding further yeah yeah okay so uh, just in terms of kind of 
AIM3, which was our kind of our support uh, uh, and um, training materials and things like that. Steve, do you want to just kind of give a quick overview of what we did? Yeah, sure. So uh, as I said uh, on the previous slide with the um, guidance that was sent out to staff once they set up, uh, that included the internet pages, uh, written and video guides. We did make use of the video guides that the um, the apps themselves provided as well, so that, that was massive help. Uh, we did include some FAQ pages, so things if there was anything around account logins. Uh, one of the biggest ones was if staff were previously using a free account uh, themselves before the trial, how they could bring that account over easily, make sure their content came through, and then they could get the additional paid for functionality. Uh, we did inter introduction workshops for all of the apps. We did an introduction workshop for the, uh, the project as a whole, um, but then each individual app had a uh, introduction, so staff could get some examples of where you might use that particular um, particular application. The dedicated uh, teller drop-ins uh, were very popular as well. So um, each of the tellers had their own uh, kind of specialist app that they focused on that staff could come along to and ask questions. But one of one of the things that was um, became quite common that staff were going to any of the tellers and providing an activity or which which one is going to suit me best suit my uh, outcomes best for this and having that conversation with that um one of the the real real good takeaways um from the trial and and into the future was the ms teams community practice space um it was a fantastic development every time someone uh, applied for a license we added them this to the area um and it worked as that kind of peer support network uh, and we will talk about a little bit more detail of that but that that's turned into a really positive space um that's really enabled things to move on at a good pace yeah yeah, just just uh, the, the, the interesting sort of question from from Jim there about how did we kind of widen it out, I and mean, we had a you know we had a we had we had a big launch about this, um, uh, and and also the word of mouth about it there was a there was a real buzz about it from those colleagues who were who were involved in it. So you rarely get such positive feedback from academic colleagues on you know how easy it is to request and set up things like that. Word of mouth played a big role in it but we did have a big we did have a big launch we also had a um a, a, a thread more or less dedicated to it in our educational technologies conference and also active learning is very much on the agenda in our institution it's kind of built into our um our new education strategy and so there is a there is a general kind of perception that these tools are really important in that particular context so there's a there's a com there's a framework of conversations that are taking place in the institution that these team the, that these tools sort of tapped into. So, right place, right time is probably a, a good way of describing it. Um, so, in terms of our evaluation of this, so seven out of ten colleagues agreed that they received all of the support that they needed during the trial. Now, um, we 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 spent a lot of time talking to colleagues around their experience of this, and it's it's just absolutely clear that some colleagues are really still absolutely terrified of using technology um, uh, for, for, for whatever reason. We've got a small group who require huge amounts of uh, elbow support because they find it really, really stressful. It makes them really anxious. It, they doubt their own skills and their ability to do things. And that's one of the things that we think are one to one um, uh, tele, tele support is kind of addressing. It's not perfectly scalable in, in that respect. Um, but um, that we need to kind of recognize that it's not it's not easy for some colleagues and it's not just about them not wanting to adapt. They've got a general genuine anxiety about it and need that little bit uh, extra support. Um, despite that fact, these, these colleagues, even though they, they, they you know, they found it, they still kept on doing it, which is which I think is a, is, is a positive. Um, so our overall kind of sort of link, linking back to our aims, our, our, our strategy basically was that if we address aim one and two, make the set up and installation of these things really, really easy, provide effective support and then a, an, an active community of practice, that that will lead to a reduced risk and increased confidence. Um, and so where we're, where we're after this, this is, this is again, this is an oversimplification of a complex analysis that we've done. But what became apparent is that colleagues perceive the risk of using these technologies differently. 
So some some colleagues are just, you know, they're pretty gung ho. They'll have a go with anything. Um, and they're not really bothered of whether it falls over or not. They'll just adapt and they'll work around it and they'll try any tool anywhere, anytime, because that's the that's the kind of person they are. We've got another group of colleagues who they're happy to give things a go, but they need to be well prepared. Uh, and they need to, you know, they need to understand what's going on and they need to feel supported by the institution. We've got another group of colleagues who perceive the risk as being quite significant. And unless the institution is supporting them and unless they've got kind of the ability to tap into either other experienced academic colleagues or technical support really, really quickly, they're finding it stressful and they're anxious about it. However, despite the different perceptions of risk, nine out of 10 of our colleagues strongly agreed that they're more likely to adopt apps that are provided by the institution and supported by the institution. And nine out of 10 strongly agreed that ongoing provision of those apps encourages them to use and to innovate with those tools. That's a really kind of significant thing uh, that, that, that we've taken out of this. So we can't change colleagues kind of perception of risk, but in providing the right kind of supportive environment and by showing an institutional commitment to a toolkit, we can get colleagues to buy into it in a more significant way. So quick pause for thought um, uh, before I kind of move on, please just turn your microphones on, pop anything in the chat. Is there anything that you'd like me to kind of pick up uh, on now? Yeah, yeah, go for it, Rob. So uh, for us, H5P is one of our newer ones that we sort of brought on stream. And um, yep. that particularly aggregates, I think, some of the functionality of some of the other tools that you you mentioned um, a little bit earlier. And so we're we're looking and we're working with the, uh, the H5P team to see if we can extend actually some of the, the tool sets. One of the, I think, questions that came up and I popped that in the chat uh, already is people very early on were saying, you know, if I spend the time to try and learn this and integrate it, and it does take a little bit more time than, you know, just yeah. creating a simple PowerPoint. I think, we, you know, we have to acknowledge that it does, you know, it is a bit more yeah. than just doing the basic, really. Um, they're sort of saying, OK, can you commit to, you know, longer than one year license uh, and so on? And uh, if you only say, oh, it's just a year for piloting and stuff, <laughs> they're just like, well, I can't be bothered, you know, or I'm, I'll worry about it when you've actually got a proper license and stuff. Oh, 100%, 100% agree with that. Um, I think one of the things that we were, as a team, we were confident of is that once we got a foot in the door, we would be able to make the case for the licenses in a longer term, uh, in a longer term way. Um, and I think we've, well, we will, we'll show you later that we've done that. In terms of H5P, we do, we, we do actually uh, license H5P institutionally, but we kind of see that as something which is more integrated with the virtual learning environment rather than something which is sitting specifically uh, in the context of our in-class teaching. Now that might be kind of a, a you know, a, a reflection of our um, lim limiting ourselves, thinking about the way that we might utilize H5P, but we, 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 we I, I recognize um, it is a, you know, there's a lot of potential there with tools like, uh, with, with tools like that to kind of bridge the gap between the VLE and what's going on in the classroom. Are there any other, other 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 questions or queries that people would like us to kind of follow up on? Just to say that that's where we started with H5P and then we've sort of brought it a little bit more out of the VLE now to try and use uh, it in other areas, particularly the voting and uh, sort of ranking yeah. tools particularly. Um, also, just to say that the uh, the tools that you've got at MMU actually um, just came down to Northampton and they actually used your tool set uh, actually to map out <laughs> and I put the Miro board on the Padlet so you can see what actually got generated uh, as a Brilliant. result of that. Oh, that's great. Thank, 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 that's just really good to know that the, 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 the disk of uh, um, that we have, we have spoken to. I, I presented it just uh, last last year, I think, initially talked about this. So that, that, that that's good to hear. And I look forward to having a look at that Miro board. We'll, we'll say a little bit about Miro in a second, because that's kind of part of our next phase, actually. <laughs> OK, so Janet, do you just want to say kind of like where we are now? Because this addresses the you know, the, yeah. the issue that, that uh, Rob has just made about kind of longer term commitment to this. Yeah. So so you're absolutely right um, that once we'd finished the trial, uh, we said, yeah, we want to do this. Uh, we then made a business case to the university and we partly we looked at finances 
Um, and I think I've said in the chat, one of the things that we'd found was that there were people not just buying individual licenses to things like Mentimeter and stuff like that, but actually they were <coughs> going and getting their faculty to buy things. And when we went to Mentimeter, they said, oh, yeah, there's a, you know, a huge number of people. You know, you've already got 600 users. All right. Who were playing for themselves or whatever it was. Um, so we did a, a business case to the university. And as I said in the chat, one of the things we did was we stopped people using faculty money and using uh, Manchester Met credit cards to buy apps. Um, and we then got £250,000 worth of investment, which actually I think they got a pretty good deal out of us, uh, investment in six apps for the next three years. Uh, some of those, as you can see, are unlimited accounts. Uh, so, for example, Padlet and Vivox. Others of them are, are, are less so, but we are increasing the number of active users massively. And I think one of the things that... Um, I can't emphasize enough how a collaboration between academic and professional services and having people both in professional services, but also uh, from the academic side working together to make sure that this happened was really, really important. I don't think it could have happened if we'd not had this great relationship. Um, and so two things there that are worth a mention, aren't they, Jade? We, we employed our institutional vendor management team to do all of the complex negotiations with with these vendors about the le levels of licensing and about the about the financial side of things and they also began the initial discussions um, and cleared up the things like gdpr and began the initial discussions around accessibility of these tools so having those professional people who really understand the gdpr regulations who really understand licensing etc cetera, etc cetera, took an awful lot of pressure off the project team I, absolutely. And I think the other thing that, that we did, um, I've, again, I've put in the chat, we started a group where people could come to us because, as we said, sometimes um, procurement don't act very quickly. Um, and we started a group that's on the centre there called the Digital Experience and Software Group. And what we were finding, and somebody's put this in the chat already, um, that people like their own solutions. Um, and really, they didn't they were just used to using a particular app. But actually, based on the analysis that we had done of the classroom activities that Rod explained to you earlier on, they didn't really necessarily need that app because the apps that we had um, that Rod had analyzed that we already got something that would do that. But they were just used to having whatever they had um, and hence the importance of support. So really, people were coming to this group saying, oh, well, you know, I need something that will paint everything pink. And we were saying, well, you don't really need something that will paint every, everything pink. We've actually got something that will paint everything any color you want. That will do. It's just not the tool that you're used to. Um, and so I think that's really, really important. Uh, and that group takes, as, as Rod said, request for non-supported apps. And we're quite we're, we're quite. Uh, robust about that we look at new and emerging apps so for example Miro wasn't on our original list of supported apps it was asked for particularly by one faculty um, and we decided to go ahead with that now and we're looking at evaluations and they're continuous as well um, and again as, as we've put on the slide there that's a very senior team um, and it's it's a team that there's also enough people in it who are able to take chairs action that if you know when we talked earlier on about oh but I need this particular thing for my particular and I need it now or sometimes in relation to research people felt they wanted something now we could put that through as chairs action and say yep yeah, there's enough people here I could phone a couple of people and say Rod what do you think yeah that will do yeah we, you're right we haven't got that and then we could put it through very quickly as chairs action. So that's been really useful in terms of those request and review processes. Absolutely. And uh, 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 Jim, Jim's point there about bringing new staff on board with, you know, with, with different tools, and stuff like that. You know, part of our part of our onboarding with with new colleagues now, uh, there's opportunities to kind of have kind of one to one inductions with our, our faculty tellers. And we talk about, you know, which tools we supply, which, which, which tools we provide. We give a lot of support to help colleagues transition from one tool into, a, in, into another. So um, I'm just going to say, I'm going to say a little bit about accessibility because I know that this is, this is a contentious issue. Um, so in our initial evaluations, 
everything that we looked at, there was a challenge around accessibility. And so we know that there are challenges. And so we kind of had a, you know, there's a little bit of a dilemma there. Do you just kind of reject everything because it currently doesn't take all of the boxes? Or the decision that we took is we're going to get involved with the app vendors and we're going to work with them and we are going to try and apply appropriate pressure to make things change, to get things better, to, 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 to have an impact on this stuff. And so we, as part of our vendor management negotiation, we flagged this up with them all right the way, right the way from the start that procurement of this is uh, in part dependent upon your willingness to enter into conversations about improving the accessibility of these tools. Um, and we had a lot of really robust and we rejected one or two tools because they didn't seem to be prepared to enter into those conversations. The tools that we did pick were all prepared to at least start and engagement with it. And so what we've done is one of our faculty technology enhanced learning advisors is a nominated app expert and they engage regularly with our community of practice. They take and you know, they're constantly gathering from our um, from, from our uh, uh, staff and from our students um, and we're engaged in originally it was monthly it's kind of a little bit further further apart now but regular meetings with the app vendors where we're feed, feeding feeding back and we've had some significant successes very very quickly vbox were fantastic when when we first got in touch with them they made some really big changes to some of the uh, uh the the interface of their of their app based on feedback that we give them and um, we can't take all, all credit for it but you know there's we've seen a big change in the in the uh in the uh, approach of Padlet towards accessibility. They've now got an accessibility statement on their website for the first time. We're not claiming responsibility for that, but I think our approach and other colleagues across the sector, by working with Padlet, have applied that pressure that's led to that change and a shift in the right direction. So it's definitely a work in progress, but we think it's the right decision. Uh, Maybe not everybody's favorite way. But we think it's the right decision to work with them rather than just reject them on the grounds that they're not quite there yet or they're not yet there yet at all. So that was our, that, that that was our approach to that. I'm happy to kind of follow up on any conversations about that if 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 colleagues want to. But I'm aware that we're running a little bit short of time, so I was going to kind of open that up a little bit more. But I'd like to get through some of the other stuff that we want to report back on. Uh, so our current state of play, where where are we at at the moment? So Stephen's going to say a little bit about our kind of our, our levels of uptake. Um, so over to you, Stephen. Yes. Yeah, so um, obviously that on the the first row there, we've got the um, license uptake from the uh, the trial itself. Um, really good numbers. Obviously, what you can see there, the total of licenses across is 921, where actually staff involved was around 400. Um, so we knew staff were they were trying things out. They were, it was, it was new. A lot of the apps were new to the majority of staff involved. They might have used one previously, and then thought, oh, that does something similar, or that does potentially will do something better for my activity. Um, so we weren't just seeing one person pick up one thing. Uh, we were seeing them trying out a few different things, which was great for us in terms of feedback we received. Um, from that, we obviously have the licenses uh, that we recorded as of about um, a month ago, um, and we can see a massive uptake. Um, again, in terms of the, the number of staff, it's around, um, around 1,400 staff have at least one um, app for teaching and learn, learning license, but you can see there we've got um, over 2,300 uh, licenses in use across all of those five applications at the moment. Um, so re a real boost from the successful trial and then into um, now now we're, I suppose we're in our second um, full academic year of the use of um, of these five apps. That 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 equates to somewhere between uh, sixty and sixty five percent of our full time teaching staff have now got and used in some way, shape, or form one of our apps for teaching and learning. And then what we've got is is actually the, the use of these these applications. So we, we do have the, the trial numbers as well as the um, those since the end of the uh, the trial. And it's it's some incredible numbers. When we when we first looked at this, we were, we were really impressed at how much. Um, just to give a little bit of information there, the student hits and um, that's where a student has engaged with that particular application and that activity. Um, so if you've got a session with students um, and you've got 10 students in that session, 
um, and they've they've at least replied to one poll, for instance, if it was in one of the um, one of the applications that provide that. Um, so things like student hits, you know, that's almost 175,000 student interactions um, since since the end of the trial. Um, and we we also noticed things like like Nearpod. It's it's not the it's 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 not the biggest um license number however there's some really specific use and it's still got a big impact in terms of that student interactions with those sessions uh generally we see maybe nearpod being used in some of the larger teaching sessions uh we know there's a lot in business and law that do use nearpod um and it's it's been really interesting having a look through um some of these some of these numbers um but you can see there the, the amount of sessions that have, that have ran uh using these applications is um it's, it's been really positive for us. Yeah, just just pick up very very quickly on a couple of questions. R Rob uh, has mentioned, you know, some of their students feeling a little bit padlitted out. Uh, we've seen some instances of that as well. Um, what I think we're seeing is some instances where kind of where Padlet has been used sort of as a I need I need to do something with technology. And part of the problem with some of the activities is the, the activities themselves are not that well designed. And so one of the things that we want to drive on next year as part of our work around our education strategy and our uh, digitally enhanced learning teaching assessment strategy is activity and active learning design. And so making sure that the tool is not the driver, that designing the activity first and foremost is what they do. And that might reduce some of that kind of notion of, of, of you know, uh, an overuse of it to just for the sake of it. So because I think purposeful use of the technology is really important. Um, question from Chris about analysis down at faculty level. We've got all of that data, Chris, where we're, we're in the middle of a kind of a really big kind of evaluation. We're going to do some follow up surveys and some follow up focus groups as well. But there is definitely a kind of a range of different users based in, um, in in the different faculties with different preferences and for different types of tools because because the, the faculties are culturally quite diff, diff, different in the way that they um, uh, a, a, approach their learning and teaching and that's reflected in their tool use. Okay, just want to say something about the one of the real big success stories is this is around um, the uh, Stephen mentioned it earlier as a sort of an afterthought when we kind of started enrolling uh, giving people licenses we automatically added them to what we called our tech for teaching and learning community space and team so originally this was just vivox kahoot menti neopod and padlet channels um and we you know we 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 just thought it would be a place where they posted questions and got responses from uh from from, from the tell team it evolved very, very quickly into something completely different. This is a very, very self-supporting space. So we've now got nearly 900 members of staff enrolled in here. Over the last three months, eight, 870 of those have been active in some way, shape or form within the team space. Lots of posts, lots of replies, not from the tell team. These are academic colleagues talking to each other about the use of these tools. Um, some of the peaks that you see in activity here are related to events and workshops and things that we've run that have kind of kind of flagged up a little bit of a, a buzz, got a little bit of excitement going. Um, and we've expanded that out now to include other kind of elements of our technology infrastructure. So we've got our uh, an area specifically around creating and using our, our video tools and uh, our VLE Moodle. We've got tips for inclusivity and accessibility and just the use of Microsoft Teams itself. This is a really big success story because because it because it, it kind of it it just sort of happened as a, as a surprise. We set it up, we 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 set it off, and it's become very very self sustaining and it's become very active. Um, so uh, just a you know nothing that we did on purpose, but a really brilliant thing that we're trying to trying to keep going and support um, as we as we go forward. I think one one thing to add to that as well, in terms of the the shown success of that, the first uh, full academic year that we had the apps in place. Um, obviously, we've got a ticketing system for raising raising queries and things like that with IT. Um, for us specifically, tell there's it's generally about fifteen hundred um, tickets yeah. a year that we might receive. For the first academic year, the apps were in place. We had twelve. 
12 tickets, which is obviously a minuscule amount compared to the uh, the majority of numbers we get. And that's down to the success of that that team's network, uh, as well as the other resources and things that we've provided, um, which was a really good test for us to go, okay, yeah, well, what we've got in place is supporting it. And obviously those those 12 tickets we did get, we can inform that in FAQs and other resources we might de develop in the future. Yeah, so just to kind of finish us off, you know, our longer term view of this, the provision of what we're called, referring to as flexible active learning is a key feature of an, our, our new digitally enhanced learning teaching and assessment strategy. We're thinking of flexible active learning as a learning design concept that engages our students in learning by doing, using a framework of formal and informal physical and online learning spaces that provides flexibility to our students in where, when and how to learn. Kind of linked into that core to our strategy um, is this notion of a learning spaces framework where we have on campus, we have formal learning spaces like lecture theatres and teaching rooms we have informal learning spaces like cafes and student hubs um, and and, and uh, uh, sort of drop-in booths we've got a core digital space in our virtual learning environment that kind of provides a gateway into our lecture capture system video streaming and electronic management of assessment tools and then our office 365 and teams environment provide an online collaborative interactive workspace for our students plus a live meeting space that we're using now. Interestingly, our apps for teaching and learning tools sit across all of these spaces. And so a key part of our strategy is, is how to utilize tools like Padlet to provide students with flexibility of, in terms of engaging with their learning. So this is just very, very quickly how that might look. So you might set a, a group task using Padlet in a, in a lecture theater. The students can take that with them because it's digital into one of the informal learning spaces and work on it together. You can then bring them back into the classroom, review their contributions on in that digital space. You can debrief on the task. You can use the basis of that Padlet as a follow up activity. So you can put some instructions in Moodle and the link to the Padlet that they've been working on in the classroom within the VLE. And then you can point them to a tab in Teams where the Padlet is also embedded and get them to work in the collaborative workspace. They might even arrange a follow up meeting to discuss this kind of thing where, they, again, they've got that digital tool and then come back into the live teaching session and debrief. So what are apps for teaching and learning in capture, capturing the inputs and the outputs of student engagement in live teaching is it facilitates access to those tools beyond the classroom. And that's a key aspect of, um, of our flexible uh, learning provision uh, going forward. And so just to kind of finish off, Janet, these are our key success factors, aren't they? I mean, I would say top of the list there was having a, a senior project sponsor in Janet who was very hands on and in, in, engaged in the project, not only faculty head of education, but also the convener of our EdTech COP, able to kind of bring all the and coalesce those things together. Um, but there were other things as well that you kind of flagged up as well, Janet. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I wouldn't want to blow my own trumpet too much, but I do think it's important that somebody senior who can have the ear of somebody senior as well. Um, we had the brilliant learning activities framework, which really helped with the app selection. We had to, we had done all that analytic work. We had a fantastic project manager um, and a great steering group who were really interested and engaged. And as we've said in the chat as well, really important to get procurement and the vendor management team on board in relation to that. Um, so it that's why we think it's worked and it's continuing to work. I have to say I did put in the chat as well. I think that uh, COVID played into our hands here. Uh, we were very lucky that in a sense that it came along at the right kind of time, something we're already thinking of doing and it gave us extra boost, which I think has been true of EdTech across across everything. I think that's about it for us, is it right? I think it is. We've kind of we've run over a little bit of so apologies for that, but I um, really hope that you found that um, a, a useful insight into what we think is a really big success story at our institution. Um, it's it's made a really massive difference uh, for, for a lot of our colleagues. Um, and it's really, I think it really has had a significant impact upon the amount of active learning that's taken place within the institution. Um, if anybody would like to follow up, we've got so much more detail that we could share with you on this. It's obviously kind of a little bit of a, a, a whistle stop tour of some of the things but if anybody wants to follow up 
Um, our contact details are there. I'll just copy and paste those as well into the um, uh, into the into the chat. Um, so please, please do get do get in touch. Um, and if you've got kind of, I say, any of your own kind of insights and experiences to 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 share, you know, we're really interested to to to, to hear your thoughts. Thanks, everybody. Please do keep in touch. We really would like to uh, carry on the conversation. That'd be great. OK, thank you. I'll just finish it all now. You've all had a little chat. I know everyone's disappearing, but thank you very much, Rod and the team. That was really interesting because I, I see exactly where you're coming from. And I look forward to seeing how it goes in. And you will be putting the next blog post together, which I will look forward to reading. That will be that will be available hopefully by the end of next week. Lovely. Thanks very much. And Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye, team. Bye, team.